Hello, everybody. We're back again. Um, we're going to try to keep it a little bit shorter than we did the last time. Sometimes I get carried away. But it sure takes a long time to download this once we, we finish. So um, try to keep it shorter. Um, yeah, this, this, this time I want to talk a little bit about uh, social structure and personality uh, theory. Um, I want to focus mainly on one of the you know, main features in uh, 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 theoretical constructs within this particular area. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll point out is with the three different theoretical paradigms we have, uh, all three of them are, are certainly micro theories looking at everyday situations, uh, everyday life up close. Uh, but symbolic interactionist uh, theory, unlike the other two, gives more credence to human agency. And as you've read, human agency is that ability of human beings to uh, affect the world through their own choices. Uh, so human agency is the ability to, to make things happen, that one is not just totally determined by the larger social structures of society, whether that be, uh, you know, whether that be uh, the, act, the uh, fault lines along racial lines and gender. These are also structural categories in society as well as identities. Uh, but race can be, is a structural category, a gender, ethnicity, uh, but, but certainly a social class. Also, the institutions of society, all these are social forces that impact our lives outside of ourselves. Uh, but agency is that ability to say no to things or to say yes. It's like the choices that we have in life and that we can move things. And we have the ability to uh, affect uh, our fate, so to speak. Uh, whereas the uh, social structure, personality, and group processes theories uh, tend to, as you may have gleaned from your reading, tend to be structural in nature. And what they're saying is, though they're focusing on the everyday life of individuals, they're saying that there's enough social st structural forces that are impinging on people's behaviors enough so that it, it tends to make society stable. Uh, so there's more emphasis on how society's structured and that how those social forces actually shape our behavior. And certainly, certainly that's the truth as well. All of these have all of the, all three of these, just like our, our our macro theories. All three of these micro theories also. Tell us something about everyday life. No, no one theory can tell us everything about the macro level of society, and no one theory can tell us about the everyday level uh, society in society. So there is this uh, notion then that when we study all three of these, we get a larger picture of what reality is and what's going on. Uh, they all have their biases. So, the, so one of the biases of uh, symbolic interactionism would be uh, that uh, it gives much more weight to individual choices and making meaning and the ability to recreate, change, to, to socially construct the reality in different ways, uh, even even though they are under the constraints of social structures. So a good analogy would be, uh, you've heard, I'm certain you've heard this one. It's like uh, you know, the house has been built and uh, so we have to live within the framework, the structure of the house, but we can certainly rearrange the furniture like we want, right? So um, this is the same same notion. The individuals we're at we're acting uh, with and against uh, these social forces that tend to shape our behavior, but we have the ability to change our minds. We we and we see this. Uh, well, it talks about it in the chapter that uh, um, 
while we may be experiencing the same social structures, how one person internalizes and reacts to that social force on their behavior and, and, and may be different from another individual simply because of their perspectives, their psychology, if you will, personality, uh, may be different. So just wanted to point this major feature out. Um, but let's look at just a little bit at, at the social structure personality theory. Uh, it's one that I, I certainly uh, think a lot uh, of, and I think a lot about it. I mean, I think I use it. I also use it in my own, own research. And it's something that we have to acknowledge here. Even if we're doing a symbolic interaction with study, uh, it's so useful a notion to focus on people's statuses and how they're and their norms and their roles they're playing. Uh, because you know, you may be in a cultural situation we don't know much about the uh, culture itself, and so yeah, or the people in terms of their, you know, their behaviors and what things mean. One thing you can focus on is the social statuses they're in. Sometimes it can be quite uh, uh, generalizable. That is, from one person to the next, or one group to the next, in terms of uh, studying. Uh, so, say for example, looking at some statuses that are higher up in the community, and then those statuses in the group that may be of lower status, and you can figure these out over time as you're doing your your research. So, it's very important to get some some sense of the for example, the power structure in a community. One way is to focus on the social structure. Uh, <clears throat> the way I usually t t talk about it, I'm just talking about this in a general fashion. I you know, leave the reading and a lot of the uh, all the nuanced concepts that come along that are in the chapter. My thing is just to sort of give you a little of my, uh, my spiel, so to speak, uh, to give you a little more... Uh, of the logic of some of these concepts and these theories, uh, say for social structure and personality. Uh, and by the way, the personality part uh, is not, uh, not, I don't really use that so much, but I, I really focus more on the social structural aspects as I'm more of a symbolic interactionist. But the, the uh, social structure perspective really helps a lot. Uh, so let's take this example. I can sort of sum this up in one sentence, and of course, I don't have a blackboard. I wish I, I did. Uh, but let, I'm just going to give you a sentence, then we can talk about it. Um, a social status, you can write this down while you're while I'm talking. I'll go back over it. A social status is a position in a social, stru social structure. A status is a position within a social structure in which we enact roles. So if you can write that down in a sentence, uh, a, a, a status is a position that we take within a social structure in which we enact roles. <clears throat> okay, so let's use the, well, let's just use the classroom. We could use any example in any situation. Uh, but let's, let's use the example of the classroom. Okay, so my status, let's make it our class if we can see each other. We're in class right now. Uh, so my status in this social structure, uh, I when I was hired on at the university, before that I was a graduate student. So at that point, I was in the social structure. My status was as a grad student. Uh, and uh, before I finished my dissertation, I finished all my classwork. Everything was done. Then I took on what's called the all but dissertation status. That's the ABD status. A lot of students don't really know about this one. It's really it's the toughest one to have to deal with because that the ABD status one is uh, no longer seen as a really as a student so much uh, you're finished with the student with the, with the studies you had to do your coursework and uh, so you no longer have any obligations to classes your professors pretty much are letting you go out and do your research for your for a dissertation you're no longer sort of you can kind of feel useless not needed 
uh, you may be still teaching though. you may be as a teaching assistant and so you'll have that uh, that status uh, but it's a long and lonely sort, sort of uh, in between two worlds you're no longer a student but you're not really a full-fledged uh, PhD doctor you're not called doctors yet so it's sort of in a limbo world if you will it can be quite quite um, nerve-wracking actually very stressful um, but anyway, uh, in this scenario, I, as the professor of the class, then I, once I was hired in, then I'm, I'm, I've taken on the formal status as the instructor in the class. And um, so I am, and in terms of the social structure of the classroom itself, there is a social structure. And uh, so the, there, there's my status as, as the professor, let's say instructor. I'm the instructor of the class you as a student you laid your money down and uh, you've come to college university college and you take up a status now who does this these this these two abstract statuses uh, the university uh, uh, professor professor instructor student status who do they belong to do they belong to me do they belong to you uh, no, they don't. We just simply, uh, in my case, being hired in to take up that that position. And for you, you've laid your money down, and now you're in the student status. Where, you know. Uh, so at this point, then we have entered into this the social structure of, of professor and students in the classroom. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, so in some sense, this is already determined before we come on the stage. And this really gets at the, the social aspect of, uh, of, the, of the statuses is that they belong, to, the statuses belong to the university. And uh, we just come along. They're there bef before we arrive and they're there after we leave. So after you finish your college degree, after I retire, somebody else comes in, takes my place. They hire a new person. And when you leave, the other students are, are brought in and they take up your, your status. Now you're no longer a student. So it's there before we come on the stage, it's thereafter. So what we're saying is that it's the educational culture and the institution of education. And, and then when we want to bring it down, uh, UNCP, it belongs to the university. And they have structured the social structure. It's, there, it's already there before we get there. And, and that includes the statuses and the, the roles and norms that we have to adhere to. Uh, so in my status uh, to you, think of it this way. Let's go ahead and look at some of the other. So the structure, the social structure is made up of two or more statuses. Interacting with each other, regardless of the, regardless of the personalities involved. And we'll talk a little bit about, about, about that more here in a second. So regardless of, of, of our personalities, the social structure is already uh, the, 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 the norms and, and um, the roles attached to the statuses have already been created, right? You're there already, regardless of my personality or yours. And we'll talk about that again in a second. Uh, so that it's already been processed for us. So what do we do as individuals in this situation? Well, this again, we take on the roles of the status. So we have to learn what is, what is let's, let's stay with uh, social expectations. Norms are about social expectations in terms of our behavior, whether it's a, a verbal behavior or, or physical, or even our looks can be a part of normative uh, uh, normative order. Uh, so uh, when we take on the roles, what we're saying here is that we're we're going to conform. So the big word here for us in understanding uh, the the social structure and, and the statuses of professor and student is that I, my behavior and your behavior is being governed by external norms. Right, the norms have already been attached to the role, to the status. That's the roles. The roles are informed by the norms. 
So for us internally, it's once we take up these positions, it is what's expected of me. A lot of a, a lot of what sociology is about is social expectation. That our pattern society, our ways of everyday life is governed by social expectations and how we adhere, how we conform to those normative pressures, those expectations. And that's the, really the bedrock of our society, of a civilized society, or, or our adherence, not 100%, because if we were 100% uh, conforming to norms, then we would be robots, right? We would be uh, what they call yes, yes, yes people, right? We'd be saying yes to everything, going along with everything. But we know we don't do that. We deviate. And that's for that's for a different chapter. Um, so so let's set up this scenario then. So you're in, we're, you guys are in the class and I'm I'm teaching. Now what am I doing? Here's here's a couple other ideas to think about. In terms of those norms that govern our statuses, it's based on rights and obligations. So the normative expectations are based on rights and it. Your, your rights and expectations. So you have your rights, I have my rights, right? And then you have your, you have your rights and then it's a, it's, it's a two way street, two way street. So much so that uh, if I didn't know any of your names in the class and you didn't know me, we could still do the class without any problem. If we if we conform our behavior to what's expected, now we don't we don't come into that situation, especially at the university level or even high school. Really, we don't come in we don't come into this uh, blindfolded because we've been we've been socialized since we were little kids in in classroom behaviors, your your rights and your obligations. We each have. Norm, norms that are governing our behavior. What are my rights as a student? What are my obligations as a student? And that has been drilled in us since first grade, right? And uh, Lord, th you know, bless those uh, elementary school teachers that uh, try to take us on as kids. I kind of joke about it a lot because, yeah, kids are kind of tough to have to socialize. But uh, man, I, well, in my own experience, high school was maybe, high school students were maybe even worse, you know, uh, in terms of uh, trying to get uh, high school students to behave themselves and to take their high school seriously. I'm not saying you didn't, you know, but uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's not, uh, it's not like a bunch of robots walking around just saying, uh, you know, doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, so it, it's a it's a lifelong learning process basically. By the time we get to university, we're expected to be adults. We're paying money to be there, and we're expected to really uh, adhere to our rights and rights and our obligations in the classroom. Uh, but we still have troublemakers in college too. We have students that cut up in class. Sometimes we have to send them out, you know, uh, and work on them a little bit. Try to get them to see their no. My, the way I generally work with it is to make try to get them to see that uh, you know this is not high school any longer, and uh, sometimes it takes a little bit of embarrassing them in front of the rest of the class, and then they usually then they'll usually uh, fall in line with it and they they get it. You know, I've never given up on any any of my students, so I always know it's just a you know it's just a coming in usually at the first of the semester. And uh, they're thinking, yeah, I'm going to treat this just like I did in 11th grade. And they come to find out all of a sudden it just doesn't work that way because you're paying to be there. You are not, you don't have to be in the classroom. Uh, so, 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 yeah, so we're, so think about this. So my right, my rights as a professor are your obligations. And your rights are my obligation. They're not personalized. It's not, it's not personal, it's, it's still structural, right? So what is our role again? 
And this is one reason why students uh, don't like sociology that much because we're always seen as not being sort of, uh, uh, you, know, you know, individualistic or, or, or uh, you know, very original in some sense, but we tend to be conformists. We conform our behavior to our within these social structures we exist in, like the family, for example. So in order to get along, in order to reach our goals together, we have to conform our behavior. Uh, so in, in this scenario, uh, my rights are your obligation, your, ob your rights are my obligation. So my, my rights would be that I expect my students to come to class on time. I expect them to, uh, to be aware and to listen to what I'm saying during the lecture time. Um, they're, not, they're not making any noise or talking in the class. That's an, that's a, that's an obligation of the students towards me. Uh, students, students uh, are my rights are to expect students to study outside of the classroom and to do their readings. I also uh, uh, a right is to ex expect students to, if you're having problems, to come to my, you know, to, to contact me and come to my office hours so we can, I can help you with things, whatever's on your mind. Uh, that's another. Uh, and also, I, I, it's my right that students really try their best to uh, study for their exams, to be there for their exams, these kinds of things. And uh, those rights of mine are your in your status as a student. Uh, you need to conform to is you're obligated to that, right? So I, you're so we're aware of each other's rights and obligations, whether we know each other or not. Right. I used to teach in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I taught I taught in Detroit for about four years. Didn't live there. I lived in a uh, different part of the state. I lived in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, and I uh, I worked for uh, Central Michigan University. But I was a weekend teacher, professor, teacher, instructor, and I taught down in the city of Detroit, around in the suburbs, or all around the city. And uh, I would go on a Friday night and I'd teach Friday night, stay there in the hotel and teach all day of Saturday. And we would, you know, it was very short formatted, very large classes, mostly adults from the auto industries. And uh, you know, we didn't really have a lot of time to get to know each other. It was only a four weekend. So in four weekends, we did what you guys are doing for a whole semester. And uh, so it was uh, short formatted courses over a four weekend period. And the uh, students, students took, uh, it was an eight week session and they would have two classes, uh, alternating weekends and uh, worked out pretty well. But uh, we didn't really get to know each other, but we could do the class anyway, just by following our conforming to our, what we know are our rights and obligations in the classroom. So for students, your rights would be, uh, for, for, for students, is that I come to class also, that I try to be there as much as possible unless other contingencies arise, uh, that, I, uh, that you have a right that I uh, do my best to try to explain what we're studying, to give you uh, insights into the concepts and the theories. Uh, also, uh, you have the right for me to try to stay on stay on topic. You know, and, you know, you see this like sometimes where professors have you got four books, or three books, and that they spend the whole time talking about fishing. Or you know, read chapter three, and I'll see you next time. You know, so that kind of that kind of goes against students' rights. Now, here's a big one, but don't pull this one on your other professor uh, about. Uh, one, one of your rights would be also in terms of uh, the kinds of exams the professor gives you. So if a professor says on the syllabus that they're giving you all, uh, they're going to give you a, a um, all multiple choice true false exams. And then come exam time, they just, you, you walk in and you're handed about 10 uh, essay questions. That that and so you sort of uh, without any any of your foreknowledge, that would be going against your rights as a student. 
to be informed about what kind of exams you're going to need to study for, right? Uh, so that would be a problem. Um, so, and you got you also have a right to my time uh, and during office hours. Of course, I'm I'm available all the time anyway. If, if unless I'm busy doing something else, but uh, you know by Usually talking after class, before class, after class. I enjoyed that. I enjoy that. Um, and so that that's that's your rights, and that's my obligation to you as, as your instructor. Um, so you see that this is just a structurally. It's been structured into the social structure that these two statuses. Are very common. So that any classroom you enter into the United States, right, or anywhere in the world, basically. Uh, when I was, I, I, I spent a, a, some time at Oxford University, uh, and I was, I was there as a residency. It was a residency where I was able to, to uh, do a little bit of, uh, well, basically it was seminars every day. I was going to, and I, and I actually lived on the campus. And guess what the name of the, you know, uh, um, Oxford's made up of different uh, colleges. And I thought it was ironic because the college that I stayed at was uh, Pembroke. Yes, I stayed at Pembroke College, Oxford University, London, England. Not London, England, it's too many. It's getting late at night. Uh, Oxford, Oxford, England. And uh, though I did stay in London too for a while, um, got to stay in the old 15th century dorms. Uh, then for our, our, our lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, was in what was called the Great Hall, and it's it's made just like a, a Harry Potter movie took their idea for the Great Hall from Oxford. Right across the street is Christ Church, and a lot of the movie was filmed, not a lot of it, but there's quite a few scenes that were filmed at Christ Church College right across the street from Pembroke there. And uh, so that was very interesting experience. Uh, but uh, even there, the classroom would be familiar to you and to me because it's still set up between that teacher and student and the expectations tend to be very similar. Right, the rights and obligation are the same. So, as a human being, you would feel pretty much comfortable in any college anywhere in the, basically in the world. So the same kinds of things are going on, regardless of the subject matter or what country it's in. So that's how society's patterned through, because it's not just social structures are not just dealing with the classroom. They're also when you leave the classroom, you're going home to your, let's say you're an older student and you've got. Um, you know, got a husband or a wife and two kids at home. Well, that's another social structure. In society, you know, the the, the, um, the rights and obligations, the the roles played in the uh, social status between male and female in our culture has already been established. So what it is is that we, you know, well, we're kind of pre-socialized as we watch romance movies and how people, couples behave, you know, through the media and, uh, our own families growing up said so that by the time we marry, we step again. We're stepping into that status once married. That's a, you know, a pretty big status. And then we have to play out those roles of husband and wife. Of course, we're not very well socialized about uh, keeping those relationships strong. And uh, so in our culture, we have some, some, some conflicts, uh, and especially today. Uh, it, it used to be strongly uh, adhered in in terms of our religious beliefs. You know, it was really looked down to get divorced, and the people were expected to stick it out. And nowadays, relationships, maybe for the, because of the heavy commercialization of society, has become more and more uh, uh, sort of a throwaway relationships where we grab one person, marrying once you're. You, you don't like, like each other too much, or you're not getting along, you fall apart. So that we have one of the highest, uh, we have a very high divorce rate, uh, almost 50%, or not quite, but it's almost uh, one out of every two marriages in a divorce. And, uh, you know, and uh, that's because of some, 
some of the issues with the social structure of, of the family is being affected by other institutions in society. Um, so the classroom then can get done. The classroom can get done because we're conforming to the uh, the role requirements, the norms that are attached to those statuses. And it makes, here's another thing to think about with social structure, it makes it makes social life uh, predictable and human beings like predictability. And in, in, in large, uh, and in large modern or postmodern societies where there's, we're dealing with strangers on a daily basis, these social structures help to make life predictable so that you don't have to really know the, the professor, you just have to know what are, what is a professor's job about? What are the rights and obligations of a professor? That's what we have to know. And then we know what it is that we have to do to relate. If a cop stops you while you're going home, then we don't we don't know that person nine times out of ten. Uh, but we do know the social status, and we know that uh, sort of things we need to do to make the uh, officer when they come to our car window. We know that we should be not grabbing under the seat or, you know, we're expected to be a, uh, a respectful, yes officer, no officer. You know, I usually put my hands up on the wheel. I've already got my billfold and license laid out. So I'm not having to reach down in the car, you know, giving it to them. Now, so when the officers, that's the social structure. The officer has his rights and obligations but the but the uh the citizen also and uh so that the norms governing that interaction is already built into the culture if you will of the of the police force now let's say all that said i'm gonna finish up with this all that said we can still have degrees of freedom of behavior within those social structures uh that policeman that stops us we, we're banking on our predictability, right? We're predicting that, that if I do what I'm supposed to do, that that uh, police officer is going to treat me with respect and we're going to be able to, you know, do this interaction and then be able to leave and go on our, our merry way. But maybe for whatever reasons, the, the, uh, maybe the officer might be in a bad mood that day or maybe the driver might not be in a very, maybe things have just happened in their lives. That's, very disturbing so things don't work out that well personality differences people that are very laid back are probably going to be very you know uh very humble and, and, and getting along with some you know there's also in terms of personality there's uh what we call people that are a personality a personality people tend to be more more assertive so now most of us are made up a little bit of both excuse me, both a little bit of A personality in some contexts and B personality in others. Then you got the extremes, people that are so B personality that the house could be on fire and they would still be having a conversation with someone, you know. Uh, then you might have a an extreme A personality where, they, you know, usually they don't like to stand, for example, at a grocery store in line. If there's a line of people, they don't, they really aren't patient about having to stand there and wait on, especially if, if People in front of you are talking with the uh, with the checkout person. Uh, I've seen that happen where people are behind them get, "Hey, come on, hurry up!" You know. So uh, a personality folks tend to can fly off the handle much more easily. So that could be a mixture of things that can that can interrupt the flow of interaction in a in a social structure. Same thing with students as well. Same thing. Same thing with professors. Uh, uh, we have we have this in all, all in this one right now, uh, but. Uh, uh, for for professors and for other occupations as well, uh, we can play our role so so tightly uh, that uh, we may come off as cold and rigid. Right? So they always start the class. They watch, and they always start at that very second that it's time to start. Uh, I used to have a professor like that myself, and uh, they leave right at the last second. Right? And uh, they don't joke around much. They get to down to business. 
So we call, there's one thing we can do in our, in our, both as a student as well as, um, as uh, professors and in many other occupations, we say, we call it role distancing. I don't think it's a good idea. One way we can be more to humanize, see, in these statuses, we, we can try to humanize our statuses. We really want to bring in some of our personality, so to speak. So one way that could be done is that some professors may, uh, you know, I, I, I'm guilty of it myself, is probably will come to class kind of dressed informal like I am now. I don't use the word t-shirts, but I do dress informal during the year. Uh, also, uh, I tend to uh, do some role distancing. Dis and what I'm saying, I'm distancing myself from the, my role itself to, some, to let students see other parts of my life. So, so point out these, uh, maybe for you, uninteresting objects. And my, and my, I'm doing that intentionally to, to Say, hey, I'm just a human being I'm first, and I, I'm also I also have my own likes and dislikes. So, so I, you know, I can back away from my status and be more, I think, uh, available to students to talk on about other things in life besides just what's going on in the classroom. And uh, however, when we, and vice versa with students as well, uh, but if we step back too far, right? We step back too far, then we're we we may be crossing the line where we were becoming deviant uh, in our in our uh, uh, job description, if you will. So that uh, if you go too far with it, then maybe you're no longer teaching the class. Uh, maybe every day you're just talking about what you did for the weekend or uh, this kind of thing, you know. Or students are that were. You know, the professor opens up to the students a little, and then the students sort of take advantage of that and think, oh, he's not uh, tough ab about anything. We can do whatever we want kind of deal. So that's when we're going too far. You know, so we have, we we learn, we, we judge, we negotiate, going back to symbolic interactionism, what we can do together, you know, in our, in our area. And we bring, in doing so, we humanize uh, social structures. Again, we're not robots. Um, Though society does really have a powerful impact on shaping our daily behaviors and we conform. Why do we conform? The question you have is why do people conform to these expectations? Well, most human beings want to put their best foot forward. You know, not all the time, but most of the time we're trying to put our best foot forward in these situations like being in class. Why? Because we have certain self-interests and uh, there's some theoretical models that we're not at yet so but there in come there will be some coming up uh, that will go into this uh, more deeply but for now i'm gonna check out and uh i'll uh i'll see you guys at the beginning of the week if you got any questions about again about any concepts you know look at my, my office hours on and for next week if you want to make an appointment uh to uh, chat with me and we, you know, we have a live chat on the website so we can meet there. And, and if it's not some, you know, sometimes if it's something that, that's going to take us a little while to you know, a little complex, we need to work on. then a lot of times I'll ask you for your phone number and then I'll call you and we can talk. You know, sometimes that, that's better, but if it's uh, over some concept you're confused about or, Something that I can, we can work on by through chatting. Uh, we'll do it that way. But the main thing is to let me know early. Um, I ask all of my students, you know, what class you're in, what uh, day of, of my office hours, uh, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, what day you want and what time you want me to be there. And so I can keep a schedule and uh, so we don't, uh, so I don't get, uh, you know, get conflicts with other classes and other other times. So keep that in mind. And uh, so I'll talk to you guys uh, uh, first of next week. And uh, we'll start with chapter three. Uh, just a little, you may have seen on the syllabus, we don't really have, we don't really have a lot of uh, readings to do next week. It's because of the exam. It's going to be coming up. So I want to kind of keep that uh, chapter a little bit open give you some more time to start studying. There's first three chapters, I think it is. 
uh, I might need to look at my syllabus. Don't 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 repeat me on that. I don't think it's the maybe it is the. I don't think it's I think it's chapter uh, one two three. Uh, usually that's the case. I don't think I said chapter four, uh, but I'll check and I'll send you a message about it. You'll see it. But anyway, so I'll let you guys go and you guys have a great rest of your weekend. And uh, I'll see you. I'll see you online. All right.